The history of how religions handle human remains upon death is a topic that will never bore me. As a young traveler years ago, I was able to see the catacombs of Paris and the memories of that experience have stuck with me ever since. The chance to discuss the catacombs near Rome was a topic I wasn't willing to pass up. On this episode, I discuss the vast Roman catacombs with Dr. William Chip Gruen from Muhlenberg College. Dr. Gruen is Professor of Religious Studies and Director at the Institute for Religious and Cultural Understanding. On this episode, we discuss his piece, Roman Catacombs, which appeared in a collection called The Reception of Jesus in the First Three Centuries, which came out in 2019 from Bloomsbury and is a massive collection. Part travel conversation, part religion conversation, this episode is a journey into the expanses of the Roman Catacomb Network, discussions of pre- and post-Constantinian times, the history of burial, and the theological importance of these sites. Also, Dr. Gruen is the host of the Religion Wise podcast, on which I was a guest. Go find Religion Wise wherever you get podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Dr. Chip Gruen, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm wondering if we can just spend a moment and have you introduce yourself a little bit to the audience so they know who you are and what you do. My name is William Chip Gruen. So I go by Chip. So uh, thanks for making a note of that. Um, I am a professor of religion studies at Muhlenberg College in eastern Pennsylvania in the Lehigh Valley, um, Allentown proper. I'm also the director of the Institute for Religious and Cultural Understanding at Muhlenberg. Wonderful. And, you know, I also want to talk a little bit about your your podcast, the Religion Wise podcast that you do at the Institute. Uh, do you want to go ahead and tell me a little bit about your, your story in podcasting, and then we'll get a little bit into your backstory? Yeah, so we started the Religion Wise podcast. Um, we're nearing the end of our first season. We started in the fall of 2022. Um, it is a production of the Institute for Religious and Cultural Understanding, um, and it really is interested in... Um, answering the question of how do we talk about religion when we're talking about religion. Um, Sort of my geeky way of talking about it is is talking about public discourse on religion. Um, So, you know, people are used to talking about religion, for example, from their own religious perspective. And even when they're thinking about religious diversity, they like to think about interfaith dialogue, which is I talk about my religion and you talk about your religion. What I'm really interested in is how do we sort of get beyond that? And we appreciate religious diversity um, from a, from a, a third party perspective as a human. I'm a human who wants to understand Hinduism or Judaism or Christianity or Buddhism or, or Islam or what have you. Um, what are the tools? What are the skills we need to develop? Um, how can we think about that public conversation that is not sort of embedded within our own religious identity, but is, um, I mean, I know it's a, a, a little bit of a dirty word for some people, but a little bit more academic, right? A little bit more of that third party perspective. Nice. Tell me a little bit about, um, how you found the process of creating a podcast, finding cool guests and everything. I'm just curious about all that stuff too, because I, I do all that stuff behind the scenes myself. So I'm always wondering about what other people are doing for their shows. Yeah, I'll say for us, it's been a real organic process Um, since our mission. I mean, I have a captive audience, right? I'm a professor of religion. I have 20, 25 students in a class period. I have them. I hope that I'm making a big influence on how they think about um, the things that are important to me, the things I've studied, the things I think are important to be an engaged citizen in our world. Um, But taking on the leadership of the Institute, which I did a few years ago, um, I mean, part of our charge is affecting public conversation as well. And so, you know, we do on-campus programming. So if you're in the Allentown, Pennsylvania uh, area, you know, you can come to that. But we've really tried to reach out, particularly with the pandemic, of having an influence that is beyond our our immediate um, sphere here um, in, in eastern Pennsylvania. And so... 
um, we jumped into the podcast. We thought it was a good way way to do that, a good way to get get a little bit of traction. Um, and so it's been a real organic process. It's been a learning experience. Um, I'm learning, and we'll see if you do this or not in this episode, but I'm learning to push my guests a little bit more yeah. when they're not being particularly clear. So, I, you know, I'm learning as we go. I mean, we're getting ready to enter into the second, second season. Um, you know, we have partnerships with a lot of other institutions here in the in the Lehigh Valley. I mean, Lehigh University, I've had several guests guests from there. Um, but then, you know, scholarly networks sort of have long fingers into lots of other places. So, um, you know, I'm happy to have just um, interviewed um, Kaku van Stuttgart from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, um, for example, um, which is another great thing about, about this medium is that you can, you know, reach out to people all around the world and, um, and, and have interesting, good conversations that you might not have been able to have a decade ago. Sure. Um, so, so I'll say it's, it's organic, right. And, and, you know, we're continuing to grow and develop and, and think about the ways um, that we can enhance that guest list and, 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 and frankly, improve our technical skills. Um, although, you know, my editor and producer um, in the Institute is, is wonderful. Um, but we're all learning on the job here, but it's been great fun. And I love how the I love the speed of it as well. Something I've heard from professors who do who dabble in podcasting is they like the speed of releasing things, which differs so drastically from the academic publishing world. So I, I'm sure you found that as well. That like the speed of putting something out into the world at your own rate is just really rewarding too, because you get those like hits of excitement so regularly. <laughs> So yeah, I, yeah, I, absolutely. Uh, on that, I mean, you know, I've had I've submitted articles to to journals before, and they said, "Well, we really love this, but it'll be about three years before it comes out." And yeah. you know, I'm interested in something else in three years. So. Exactly, exactly. Well, let's do some let's do some chat about your work. So I know that you um, work large. Your work largely focuses on ancient Christianity, uh, and I know that you've expanded in scope throughout your career and you do a lot of modern stuff at the Institute as well, but I really am fascinated about any major turning points in your own life um, as a thinker, as a student, as a scholar that led you down the path of being interested in ancient Christianities. What were some major turning points in your life along the way? Yeah, it's, it's funny. Um, my academic career, I think, is is one of those that was un unpredictable in a lot of ways. Um, and since you're asking for a biography, I wouldn't bore bore you with it otherwise. But I'll just jump into it. When I arrived at the University of Kentucky as an undergraduate, I was not particularly interested in in ancient things necessarily, um, or you know, particularly in religion. Um, but part of the the curriculum there required a, a foreign language. I had taken a lot of Spanish in high school. And was like, I'm going to do something else, and just happened to see classical Greek um, in the Attic Greek in the catalog, and I thought, I'm going to do that. That sounds different, sounds a little exotic. I'm going to do that. And so, actually, my my pathways in really started through um, the Greek language, um, and so I did, uh, you know, finished my requirement for the Greek language, but then sort of got hooked. Um, there were a couple of classes um, by a professor's names. Bruce Holly um, at the University of Kentucky. He taught one was um, Roman Jew and Greek backgrounds to Christianity. And the other one was Christianity in the Roman Empire. And I took both of those and was pretty hooked. Um, I, it was just, it's just such a more complicated, um, more dynamic, more interesting field than I think a lot of people, um, you know, sort of appreciate. Um, so I, I did that. Um, I, I went on, I mean, back in the day, in the 90s, there was no such thing as religious studies in a state school in, you know, the Midwest or the South in, in Kentucky. Um, and so I sort of pieced it together through history and classics, went on actually to a master's at the University of Cincinnati in ancient history, still did not really know that the field of academic study of religion existed. And then when I applied to Penn, um, my would-be advisor actually said, hey, I see you've applied in ancient history, but maybe you'd be more comfortable in religious studies. Mm -hmm. And sort of the rest is history. <laughs> nice. Well, and, and the field, even though it's so long ago, continues to develop. I was reading a book uh, by Paul Stevenson called New Rome, where he was talking about using the, like the layers of um, archaeology and you know tracking climate change data throughout mm -hmm. the years to like study like the history of developing like metallurgy 
and uh, fields like that that like stemmed out of Rome. And so I know the field is still dynamic, even though it's so old. Have you been noticing that as well, that it continues to grow and expand with new technology? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, I, you know, I'll say if you look at the, the history of studying um, ancient Christianity in particular, you can imagine that a lot of the initial interest was, you know, theologically motivated. I mean, you know, a lot of the, um, you know, the early work, uh, a lot of the critical editions, for example, are coming out of 19th century Germany, you know, that you have these Lutheran theologians who are really interested in these questions, and it sort of grows from there. And so you have a couple steps, right? One is thinking about these things in terms of a, you know, sociological, anthropological, historical perspective that happens sort of in fits and spurts over the course of the 20th century. You get the the foundation really of the uh, academic dis dis discipline of religious studies that really doesn't take off until the 1960s. Um, so that changes things a little bit. And then again, the, the technology, um, yeah, absolutely is a part of it. I mean, the one, one part of that that I'm most excited about is uh, that we have these charred, burned scrolls from, you know, from places like Pompeii, for example, and they're figuring out ways to digitally unroll them, you know, so that you can read them. Because if you try to physically unroll them, they, you know, they fall into dust. Um, so, yeah, there is there is a lot of technology. It's funny, though, technology is a double edged sword, because on the one hand, that is very exciting and, and, and very interesting. Uh, I think there are other trends that people have of wanting to, to connect people up to, you know, uh, brain imaging systems to, to help them think about the way that they think about their own religion. And, and I, I don't know, I have my questions about how useful that is. Um, so, but, you know, always leveling our newest technology at questions that we, that we have is a good idea. Awesome. Well, we're going to discuss some of your work now, and we're going to discuss the topic of Roman catacombs specifically which I've never covered on this show. And every time a new topic that I've never even broached before comes up, I always like to make a point of saying it verbally that this exists nowhere else in the entire history of this podcast. And you wrote a chapter on the topic in a massive collection called The Reception of Jesus in the First Three Centuries, which came out in 2019 from Bloomsbury. And I wonder if you can just tell me a little bit about this collection because it's insanely big. And I just want to know about your perception on the collection and then how you came to be involved in this insanely huge gargantuan piece of work. Yeah. So the collection um, is it's three volumes. Unfortunately, I mean, hopefully your local library holds it because unfortunately it's very expensive because of all of the graphics and language and what it takes to, to typeset such a thing. Um, but it's three volumes. My, um, my piece uh, is in volume three from, from Kelsis to the catacombs. And it's about, the whole thing is about um, reception history, um, which is a little bit of a new way of thinking about, um, you know, about topics in ancient Christianity and, and other religious traditions for that matter. So instead of thinking about source history, which we've done for a long time. So you're reading, for example, a gospel, right? Gospel of Luke. And you're thinking about what are the sources that lead to the building of that, right? Are there oral traditions, for example? Is there uh, another body of literature? Are there other earlier gospels that are being sort of used for the creation of that gospel? Reception history really thinks about sort of moving forward. Um, how are, so this is the reception history, history of Jesus. How is Jesus remembered, um, imagined, um, you know, incorporated into cultural you know, the cultural and personal lives of, of people later, you know, so for this particular project dealing with the catacombs, you know, that are happening obviously much later than those gospel traditions, than the Jesus tradition itself, how is Jesus remembered then? Mm. Um, and how is he incorporated, um, you know, in those later traditions? Because it's, it's not enough to say, oh, well, look, they're cribbing on gospel traditions. They're right. using gospel traditions because it's actually a little bit more, it's quite a bit more complicated than that. Gotcha. Well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, and, and you know, one of the editors, um, Chris Keith, um, who is uh, one of the editors of this volume, is somebody who I've kind of gotten to know um, through the process, knew a little bit before this as, as well. And it, it's a funny thing. I mean, we grew up, um, you know, very near one another, actually, in, um, in Kentucky. We, we sort of 
wonder how many people who do the kinds of things we do grew up in that area. It can't be very many, um, yeah. but we have uh, good conversations about, about growing up in and around Jefferson County, Kentucky, where Louisville is. So it's kind of one of those funny things, but I'm super happy to have a professional relationship now through this work. I love it. Well, I loved this piece a lot, and I it's like covered in notes here, and I had a blast reading it. And I want to know about some of your early memories of being exposed to catacombs in Rome and why this, like, you know, this possibly macabre topic caught your attention. Tell me a little bit about your fascination with catacombs in general. Yeah, I mean, it might come as a surprise to you, but when, you know, when we were talking about this earlier and you, you described it as, as morbid or macabre. Uh, I, I, it took me back a minute and I was like, Oh really? Is it, does it seem that way? And I guess it is a burial ground with lots of skeletons in it. Maybe, maybe that's, that's a totally normal uh, reaction. I, you know, I think um, because the vast majority of my work on this topic and in other things, if you look at my catalog, catalog of work on ancient Christianity, it all happens sort of as with, Constantine, Emperor Constantine, early fourth century as the end point. Once we get too much past Constantine, my, uh, my, I, mean, I won't say my interest declines, but at least my research interest declines. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing about that is that when Constantine comes to power is when the early Christian church starts, first gets material resources that they can build big churches and make fine art um, and copy texts and do all the things that will last. Mm -hmm. So if you are talking about a period before Constantine, we have texts, but they're copies of copies of copies of copies of texts, right? Most of our copies of texts are coming from the Middle Ages. They're not the material culture of the early Christians themselves. And so early on, I became really interested with, okay, we don't have a lot of material culture before Constantine, but what do we have and how can we talk about it? Um, and so this, you know, this collection fits perfectly for that because it's, you know, the reception of Jesus before Constantine, right? So that that's perfect for me. Um, and so my piece itself sort of concentrates on the sections of the catacombs that we think are are earlier in that very early period. So, and, and, and I'll just say, um, this isn't just graveyards. It's not just going and seeing names and dates. Mm -hmm. That the thing that is so wonderful to me um, about these, and if you ever get the chance, anybody listening ever gets the chance to roam, it's easier to see the Colosseum and the Forum and things in the middle of the city if you're only there for a day. It's a little bit of a labor of love to get outside the city walls to these locations. But if you're interested in this, go do it. It's super, super interesting. It's super useful because once you descend into this world, the subterranean world of catacombs, you see, um, I mean, frescoes are the thing that are most impressive. The, the paintings um, that are happening on, on top of the wet plaster as they cover a grave. Um, and you see depictions of, um, of, of all types of scenes. I mean, scenes from the life of Jesus or, or, or some of what I deal with here, but scenes from... Um, from the Hebrew Bible as well, and also scenes from uh, pagan mythology as well, because these are not only Christian sites, they're a mix um, of Christian, Jewish, pagan uh, burial grounds um, in, this, in this underground world. So it, it really is the fact that it's a cemetery is important, of course, but the, that it is the best repository of the, the visual arts um, from this early Christian period is really, I think, what drew me in um, to to thinking about these these places. Nice. I'm curious about just Rome in general. Uh, geek out on me with some travel for a second. Tell me about your your love of Rome, just as a place. I'm I'm telling you, uh, uh, it is my favorite place on earth. Um, I you know I went first in the early '90s. Um, um, sort of my 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 eventual wife, my wife now was studying abroad in France. I went to see her and sort of said, Hey, what if we got on a train and went down into Rome? And, you know, we've 
never looked back. We both super, super enjoy the city. Um, you know, I've been, you know, on a half dozen occasions since then and um, was lucky enough to get a research fellowship to study the catacombs right before the pandemic. Um, so was there for for a month, six weeks, just doing doing some of this work. Um, yeah, I love Rome. I, I love the Italian people, you know, not, you know, the, the culture, the, um, the, the challenge of, of being there, of navigating. I mean, I just love travel, I, I guess is a lot of it. Um, but you go into Rome and, uh, any other city in the, well, maybe not any other city in the world, but most other cities in the world, things that you just pass on your way to get an espresso would be the highlight of a city's, arch you know, architectural tour, you know, in most other places. It's just so full of not only the, Roman Republican and Imperial stuff, but then the early Christian stuff and medieval, and then, you know, the papacy and the development of the Catholic church and the Renaissance. I mean, it is just a, a fabulous, fabulous place. Um, so uh, I, I hope for myself many happy returns because I just, I just love it. Okay, great. So I want to know more about, you mentioned that it's outside the city getting there. Tell me some logistics. And then like, I want to know about like, a sensory picture and feelings you associate with going to a catacomb, like what it's like to enter Roman catacombs. How do you get there? Like, give me some nitty gritty here and some sensory details. Yeah. Well, what's important to first realize um, about these uh, places is that it is illegal during the Roman empire to bury anybody within the city walls. Um, and I think that that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that there, uh, there, there are particular, religious scruples about death and dying. I mean, basically every, every religious tradition and, and Roman paganism was no different. So that your, um, your burial places are, are outside the, the city walls. Um, and the ancient city of Rome and the modern city of Rome are pretty much occupy exactly the same, the same area, the same territory. So if it was outside the city, then it will be outside the city now. Um, one of the I mean, one of the things that I think is, and I'll get to sort of what happens when one arrives and how one gets there, but just sort of conceptually for a minute, one of the things that's really interesting here is that the Romans, right, we have basically two choices um, when someone dies, what to do with the body, right? You can bury it, inhumation, or you can cremate it and dispose of the ashes. Um, and the Romans, you know, from the Republican period up into the early empire are definitely cremation, that that is their way of disposal of the dead. Um, and one of the interesting things that happens in the early second century is that we kind of, with early second century CE, so during the empire, we get this cultural shift. Well, I like to talk about it as three cultural shifts for your, for your trivia. Um, one is that we start getting inhumation of the dead rather than cremation. Um, and then that's, we can talk about why that might be. Um, another one is... Um, that we start moving to codex um, books, uh, like a, what we think of as a book, rather than a scroll, um, which just happens to happen about the same time. And the third one is that men start wearing beards. Um, like the imperial statues all start having beards and whatever the emperor does, everybody else does, right? So men start wearing beards. I think the last one is, I don't know, maybe just fashion. I don't know how, how important that is. The other two are really important to my work though, um, because with inhumation, as we've talked about, you, you then get burial sites that you that you decorate and, and that are remembered for us um, in these underground tombs. And then, though it's not the content of what we're talking about today, is that you get manuscripts in book form um, that survive and really affect the way that, that ancients collect texts, use texts um, moving forward. So um, it's, it's, it's an, you know, a, a really dynamic time um, in the empire, at least, you know, for those two things that would really affect Christianity moving forward. So, um, so we get in inhumation, we get, you know, we could, you know, people hypothesize that the rising population of both Christians and Jews who feel like they need their body for a resurrection of the body, um, at least many sects, not all sects of, of Christians and Jews believe that, but many do, um, so that you you need the body. So that would lead to an increase in, in a culture of burial. Um, and then for whatever reason, it just, it, it catches on. And so you get lots of, of pagan burials or not. We don't know that that's the reason, but it's, I think it's a, it's a hypothesis worth, um, worth considering. So 
um, as I said, it is difficult. What you what you have to do to get to one of these catacombs, um, unless you have really good appetite for walking, you will take a subway maybe just to the out the outer uh, uh, reaches of the city, get off the subway, and then find um, a bus. Um, and anybody who is an, a global urban traveler knows that that buses are always much more difficult than than subways because yeah. they seem much more unpredictable. Yeah. Um, like, oh my gosh, is this going the right way? And you're constantly looking at signs and second guessing yourself. It's horrifying. Absolutely. Subways are the way to go. Um, but yeah, so you have to take take a bus out to the outer reaches and then still you get off the bus and you're disoriented and you have to figure out which way to go. But a, a, a number of these are actually out near the old Appian Way. Um, this is a very popular place where there, there are grave, graves and, and actually places where cremation remains were left um, in the Republic and the Empire as well. So there's, there's a sort of a, a long history of disposal of the dead along the Appian Way. Um, but you, you go, um, you know, and, and these sites now, one of the things that's interesting about them too is that these sites, if they are open to the public at all, they tend to be overseen by the church. Mm -hmm. um, they're not sort of the under the auspices of the public you know, of, of the city of Rome or of the antiquities commissions in Italy or anything like that, which is different from a lot of the, the other ruins, the imperial Roman imperial ruins, for example. Um, so that you are entering into a place that people, you know, the, the people who are the custodians, their view as sacred, as holy. So it has an air of, um, an air of going to a, a religious site um, rather than a historical or cultural site. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and um, and so that there is also then a narrative that you get told um, if you're taking a public tour on these sites that doesn't actually always match up with the with the story that I tell in this piece and that other scholars of the catacombs tell in their pieces. You know, so for example, the the story of martyrdom, for example, is very much inflated. I mean, there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Christian graves, you know, tens of thousands, you know, of Christian graves. And the, the, the idea that somehow this is like mostly populated by martyrs of the, of the faith is just, it, it's, it's very much overblown. Or you get the story that Christians took refuge in the uh, catacombs from, um, for per, from perse Christian persecution by the Romans. Again, there's not Evident, not good evidence for that as being a thing or that Christians worshiped um, in these catacombs um, is not, there's not a lot of good evidence for any of those things. What we have is we have burial grounds, right? And so one of the things in this piece that I really try to push forward is, okay, imagine what happens at a, a burial site. You go, you remember your loved one, you're mainly there during the time of the, of the burial itself. Um, but you probably don't want to just hang out there um, ad infinitum. Like what, what ends up happening is actually above these sites. There are parks. It seems like there, there, there are parks. There are places where one can have a meal in commemoration of the day um, that your loved one died, for example, to remember um, the loved one. And so you would spend a nice, pleasant afternoon in the park above, you know, eat, having this commemorative meal, but would maybe go down and visit the grave um, but when you go down in these places, I mean, they're not the most pleasant places to be. They're dark. They stink, um, not because of death, but they stink because of, um, you know, moisture being trapped underground. I mean, particularly now with the tourists and the pilgrims, you know, people are sweaty on a hot Roman day and they go down there and they leave all their sweat down there and then they come up. It's kind of like being in the pyramids in Egypt. It's just really dank and nasty. Um, you know, so, but this is not a place where you would want to spend lots and lots of time. Um, but, you know, what do you do? You go down and you think about hope for the future of your loved one. You think about you know, your own passing. I mean, all the things that we as humans think about when we think about death, I think, are associated. And so that's where thinking about the the pictures, like what are they choosing to depict is interesting, right? Because they're not just random pieces of Christian art, but they're pieces of Christian art that people want to consider when they're also thinking about their loved ones and they're thinking about death. Yeah. Yeah. The artwork aspect of it is really fascinating to me as well. And I hadn't even really considered that. And, you know, something else that really jumps out at me as I'm reading your piece is the, the importance of Constantine, which you mentioned briefly earlier and i'm wondering if there's like 
about pre and post Constantinian times with burial and like just the concept of burial in general and the origin of catacombs. Like where, why did the Romans start burying people and how did that history all come about? Yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, that early second century period, when we move from cremation and inhumation, like I say, we don't really know, we can conjecture on why that might happen um, on, on, but but a lot of a lot of people say that this is kind of a cultural shift. It's just a cultural shift. It's it's one of those things, right? Why do skirt lengths go up and down, or why do people wear their hair in different ways? That that this becomes sort of fashionable. Um, there might be more to it about people needing the body, sort of eschatological thinking, thinking about the end times that people want to to hold on to their body. Um, I mean, that's not you know unheard of in in other religious traditions. Certainly, is the case in in Judaism and Pharisaic Judaism in particular, or if you're familiar with Pharaonic Egypt, right? People felt like they needed their bodies for the afterlife. So, so something like that is happening at Rome in this early second century. Um, the, you know, the, the other thing, I mean, uh, just to, to talk about Constantine for a minute, I think the thing that is important about that shift is just that there's money. Um, that if there is any money for, um, Christian art and architecture before Constantine, it's private. Um, and with Constantine coming to the throne, um, you know, that there would be imperial patronage of religious sites, of Christian practice, of ritual specialists, those sorts of things. Um, and so I, I think that that ends up being the, the biggest thing, which is why we end up with these huge complexes. So I'm interested in this before Constantinian period. These run for a few centuries um, and, you know, then beyond Constantine until, you know, problems, political, military, social problems happen at Rome. Rome becomes depopulated and people actually forget about them for a thousand years, which is oh, actually wow. very, very lucky for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because then they, they can't be looted for that thousand years. Um, and so they're, they're, you know, become rediscovered um, in the the sort of around the, the time of the Renaissance and, and moving forward. Um, I, and I, you know, as I sit here, I'm in my late forties before I um, expire from this world, God willing, I'm sure there will be more catacombs discovered. I mean, it's just, you know, there are lots, it's not just that there are the three or four that I mentioned, but there are um, dozens and dozens of these comprising over um, something like 30 miles of tunnels. I mean, oh it's, they're gosh. just very, very massive complexes. Yeah, some of the ones that you mentioned, you mentioned Priscilla, uh, Domitia, San Callisto, San Sebastiano, and you mentioned there are about 30 miles of tunnels. I'm wondering, like, how much have you, like, personally traversed? Tell me about some of your explorations inside of these. Yeah, you know, I, I think uh, it, it is an unfortunate thing um, that um, that the vast majority of the um, tunnels themselves are inaccessible, right? That, so there have been certain places where the best artistic remains, for example, have been sort of cleaned up for public consumption. Um, and so any bones that were removed or, or they are sort of moved to other levels because people will steal them, you know, to have relics of the, of the catacombs, for example. Um, but yeah, there are, but there are like, vast, vast, vast tunnels. And you can get special permission to go into those tunnels, but you need to hire, um, you know, the custodian who's, who's present. And I think a scholar associated with the church, like there are all of these people that have to go with that special permission that are then paid hourly, not a small amount. So it actually becomes very difficult, particularly the ones that are closely connected with Christianity. It becomes very difficult and very, very expensive um, to go and, um, and, and traverse these things. Um, so, you know, the, the majority of my experiences in these places, um, have actually been, you know, the, the places that are pretty well worn, um, you know, because you, one can only so often, you know, get together sort of the money and the time and the patience with the bureaucracy, um, to get the special permission to go into other places. Um, I will say that there is a, um, there are other organizations that have custodianship of, for example, Jewish catacombs, um, ones that the Christian church is not so interested in. And those, those can be, I mean, they're 
open less often, but those are less heavily controlled and um, can be um, accessed a little bit more easily. Doesn't unfortunately coincide with a lot of my work. Um, but yeah, it's, um, uh, I, I will say, I, you know, obviously I haven't gotten into to every one of them because there are so many of them, but I have found that if you can get off the beaten track, off the ones that are the ones that, you know, people sort of might know about uh, if they're informed of the topic, but if you can get off that beaten track, you can get a good guide because um, you do not want to, you know, you know, get away from that group because you could end up lost yeah. um, for 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 long amounts of time. Um, but you get a good guide who will show you around and and you tell them who you are and what you're interested in, and they can they can help help a lot. So those personal connections are are really key, really important. Do you have a favorite catacomb or a favorite guide? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, even though they, well, hmm, hmm, hmm. it's a tough question. You know, I think my favorite catacomb is always the one I've been in most recently um, because, the, you know, you're, you're seeing something new. You're seeing something that you didn't notice before. It's really hard to get away from some of the big um, Sebastiano or Callisto uh, because they're well known for a reason. I mean, they just have some outstanding um, representations of this uh, early Christian art. Um, you know, and they're, they're, they're just the classic examples. Um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I, 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 so each time I go to Rome, I try to add a few more, but I always go back to the old, old faithfuls as well, just because, you know, there's, there's just something about them. And, and let me, let me just say, just because we've talked about the catacombs and, and I haven't really given a good explanation as to what exactly they are. Sure. So, so let me, let me do that. Well, and- um, so we think, when you do that, can you maybe give a little theological importance as well, just to kind of tie all that together? Sure. Yeah, I'll I'll tell you the the, the some of the stories that the guides might tell you, and maybe offer my historical corrective um, awesome. as we go as well. Um, so when we think of a burial ground, I mean, we think of being on ground level, digging a hole, right, putting a, a the casket in there, and then covering it up. Um, not a super efficient use of space, for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, depending on what you feel about these spaces and what you think is sightly or unsightly or your ideas about purity regulations and so forth, you know, not, not the choice that everybody will make. Well, there is a, a solution to this problem that the Romans discovered, and we don't exactly know how, how they discovered. I mean, they're engineers par excellence, right? That's one thing you have to know about the ancient Romans. They could do things that, that it took you know, a thousand years, once the Romans or, or the ancient Romans, um, you know, are, are gone or, or the cultural knowledge of how to do some of these things disappeared, you know, it took us into the modern period to figure out some of the things. For example, what they can do with concrete is, is just amazing. Um, so one of the engineering things that they discovered is that in the environs of Rome, so Italy, the Italian peninsula is very, very volcanic. Mm. Um, and so volcanic rock, or at least this, not a geologist, so if I get any of this wrong, forgive me. Um, but um, the, the, the type of rock that is deposited by the volcanoes on the Italian peninsula, is called tufa, uh, T-U-F-A. Um, and tufa is very porous, very soft, um, until it gets exposed to oxygen. And once it's exposed to the, to the air, it becomes much more rigid and much more difficult. So what they discovered is that you could dig down a shaft down, I don't know, um, 10 feet, say, and then start digging horizontally, um, you know, parallel to ground level. And you could dig long galleries, um, long tunnels. um, And the tufa could be excavated, could be hauled out. But then once the rock itself was exposed, the air would become hard and stable. And so it is, you know, a part of the ecological landscape of Rome that makes these things possible. Um, And so they would dig and dig and dig uh, these long galleries. And then as they dig these galleries, you could dig. um, And if you just go and Google Roman catacombs and you'll see pictures of these, that you'll see niches in the wall um, they're called um, loculi, uh, these, these niches in the wall that were then dug out to accommodate the size of a, of a body. Um, if you were a little wealthier, you could have a, a semicircular 
um, niche, you know, a niche with a semicircular surround around it so that it could be better decorated. If you're really wealthy, you could have a private uh, room um, that is off one of the main um, galleries or the main hallways, and maybe your whole family could be buried in there, and you could commission artwork to happen in there. So it's, it's a very... Um, I mean, you can see the different strata of socioeconomics happening here too. And the best, yeah. you know, where the best artwork is, is, you know, in the wealthiest parts, parts of the, of the thing. So, and then what's also interesting is you can imagine you dig, you know, whatever it is, several hundred yards or, or in one direction. And, and you can imagine if you see maps of these things, they look like city maps. I mean, that's what they're called underground cities of the dead, because not only do they dig that straight gallery, but they'll dig perpendicular galleries and then other avenues along there. This is why people, there are stories about people getting lost in them, mm -hmm. you know, um, particularly when they're first discovered. But then when you get sort of you feel like for whatever reason you've come, you know, close to the river or close to bedrock of another kind or whatever, that you're not finished but you can just go down another story. Wow. Um, and so then you can dig a second floor underground. And, then, and when that one is exhausted, you can go. So they go down three, four, five stories. Man. And if you think about this for a minute, the oldest ones are on the surface. And then the newer ones, I mean, by newer, fourth, fifth, sixth centuries, you go down. So by the time you get sort of four stories underground, you're dealing with late antiquity. Um, but it's a, there's sort of a chronological record of burial practices that happens as well. I love the fact that the newest ones are all the way on the bottom too. That's so fun. That's such a fun little tidbit that makes me so happy to know. Um, Cause I probably never would have thought about that. You know what I mean? Like, that's just so neat. Uh, tell me a little bit about like the theology. Is there any like, uh, you know, connection here that we should tie in specifically to religion in general um, that you feel like it's worth the audience knowing a little bit more about? Because obviously there's so much, but like, what do you think everybody should know? Well, I, I mean, I think, and, and this is one of the things I really push in my piece is that the way that these need to be understood as serving the psychological, social, cultural functions that people need with the death of a loved one, right? That that's like, it's really easy to not imagine those people who lived almost 2000 years ago as not really human like us, as somehow alien, as somehow different. But the birth of a baby is met the same way. The death of a, a elder in the community is, is met the same way. A marriage is, I mean, it's not exactly imagined exactly the same way as we would, but that these are life um, events that need to be marked. And so I'd say there's a, a human, a human sort of grappling um, with death that you can see happen. And as I mentioned, there are pagan, there are Jewish, there are Christian ones. Obviously, the stories they're going to tell, the narratives they're going to tell to deal with that are different. But you can kind of get behind that and see how that there's always a logic. Mm -hmm. So, um, so. Of course, um, let's just talk about the Christian ones. I mean, we could take some more time and talk about pagan and Jewish representations. But if we talk about the Christian ones, for example, um, that there are lots of depictions of what we call the Jonah cycle, mm -hmm. um, which is a story from Hebrew Bible. So if you're familiar with Hebrew Bible, the story of Jonah is that he is... Um, he is commanded by God to go um, and perform this, this, this service for God in a land that he's not, he's not super fond of, um, and he refuses to go and, um, or goes begrudgingly, um, and um, he, he's just not in, uh, you know, sort of following God's commands the way that, 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 that God wants. He, he tries to get away, um, and... Um, and he, he tries to get away by taking a boat um, to another, uh, uh, to somewhere else to get away from what God wants him to do. And the people figure it out. They figure out that somebody is cursed on that boat and they figure it out. It's Jonah and they throw him into the sea and he gets swallowed by a giant sea monster. Um, and he, you know, lives in the belly of this giant sea monster for um, three days um, until he sort of repents um, and then he spit up again into the into uh, uh, on the on the land, 
um, and he sort of learned his lesson. Well, it's not hard to imagine that for both Jewish and Christian audiences, but maybe even more so for Christian audiences, how apropos this story is when one is thinking about death and resurrection. So the belly of the whale is not, or the belly of the sea monster or the giant fish is not just um, sort of a, a weird biological thing, right? But is instead an allegory of what it means to die, go to the depths of the ocean, go to the underworld, right? And then be spit out again in three days. So you could imagine it as being um, representative of your, your own journey. And for the purposes of, um, you know, of, of this collection of remembering the story of Jesus, you know, the three days in the belly of the whale sounds like three days in the tomb as well. So, you know, that one could imagine sort of re recreate sort of some of the theological impulses that lead people to use that Jonah cycle um, about being about death. Now, one of the things that, that I really was really excited to do in this piece is since we're able to date some of these within, you know, within a generation, the, the paintings were from within a generation, sometimes even closer, that we also have datable sermons from people who are preaching and teaching in and around Rome at the same time. Oh, cool. And so I really like to see like, okay, this seems to be happening in the very late third century. Who is preaching what about Jonah at the time? Um, or who is preaching about you know, what are they preaching about the death of Lazarus at the time? Mm -hmm. And so saying, you know, imagining, like we have no evidence that the people who are hearing those sermons are the same people who are seeing those paintings, but imagining that there is a, a zeitgeist, if you will, that there's a way of thinking about, about the life of the individual Christian, about the life of Jesus, about death and resurrection, about those Hebrew Bible stories and how they're interpreted allegorically and putting together like a whole um, sort of complex of, of understanding, right? Uh, of, of trying to get in the minds of some of those early Christians of what they're thinking about these topics by putting all of those pieces together. Yeah. You know, that's really fascinating to think about if the artwork in catacombs is connected to sermons that exist in that time period. That is just so fascinating as well. Um, are there any, like, further studies that you plan to do in this kind of area in the future? Are you Have you moved on academically into other areas of interest? Like, what does the future hold for you in, in some of your scholarship? Well, I'm, I'm generally interested, there are two reasons that this topic interests me, aside from just it being old stuff that I think is really cool, that is a miracle yeah. that it survived. Um, but one of them is just, you know, the, the material culture itself. So I've done, we have very, like I said, very little, but we have some graffiti that has survived from ancient Christians, also as detailed by other authors in, in this collection. Um, we have a few house churches. Um, you know, we have, you know, obviously the catacombs, the frescoes, we have some sculptural work. So, you know, just thinking broadly about what is represented and how it's represented in material culture is something that, you know, if I don't do a magnum opus on, you know, as, as, as a collection, I mean, it certainly inspires my teaching about this area to be able to point to students when we're reading New Testament, for example, or reading ancient Christian literature, point to these things and see how they are all connecting, connecting to one another. Um, the broader issue, and, and this gets um, at my work at, in the Institute for Religious and Cultural Understanding as well, is that in that pre-Constantinian period, we are of course dealing with the minority. Um, Christians are very much in the minority in this period. Um, and then even after Christian ascendancy, post-Constantine, which takes a little while to happen, but even after that happens, that we still have not a monolithic whole of Christians, but there are some Christians who believe X and some who believe Y and, you know, the, who, depending on what the emperor believes, right, that they're, yeah. so this question of marginality is super interesting to me. You know, if you are not a part of the mainstream, if you're not in the majority, what, how are your beliefs represented? How do you feel about sharing them with others through your artwork, for example, um, or through your writings? Um, how does majoritarian culture um, 
consider the ideas of the minority. And this is, I mean, you can see very easily, I think, how this is applicable to the contemporary world. Um, I mean, obviously, there are a million ways in which our world is very different from the Roman world. But there are ways in which it's similar too. Um, we think about, you know, people from all over the Mediterranean, you know, Egyptian or from Asia Minor or from Carthage, and North Africa or Jews uh, from Judea and from elsewhere. Um, you know, that, that this is um, a multicultural, diverse world. And so thinking about um, how all of those pieces fit together and how sometimes they live together well, and sometimes they don't live together well, I think is, is sort of the larger project that I'm interested in. So almost everything I write, you can see that negotiation between, okay, this might be what these people believe, but how does that fit into sort of the larger landscape um, of things that people would be aware of culturally at the time? Um, and so I think, you know, this, this is my first shot for the catacombs. I think there's much, much more to say here um, that could, um, you know, that, that could be expanded into thinking about some of those issues that are not just sort of archaeological or art historical issues, but are instead also anthropological, sociological issues about how these catacombs are functioning. I love it. Well, Dr. Chip Gruen, uh, maybe you could spend a moment and remind listeners where they can find your work uh, and just kind of promote some stuff that you think that people should check out if they want to know more about what you do and follow along in the future. All right. So I think the, the place where I'm most publicly facing um, is the at the Institute for Religious and Cultural Understanding. So to see everything that we do there, you can go to religionandculture.com. Um, that will redirect you to our site, religionandculture.com. And you can see our first Fridays where we interview people from various types of religious communities about their own beliefs and practices, about their worldviews. You can also find um, our podcast, Religion Wise, um, on any of the major podcast purveyors, um, it is available, religion-wise, one word. Um, and um, if you do go to the Religion and Culture uh, website, you'll find my CV there, and you can find any of the bibliographic information for anything that we've talked about um, and my interests more generally. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking me down a trip through the Roman catacombs and you know, telling me all about this wonderful thing that people can go and see for themselves if they find themselves in Rome. It's been a real pleasure uh, checking out your work, and people can also find your work in that collection, The Reception of Jesus in the First Three Centuries from Bloomsbury, which came out in 2019. But definitely check the library first if you're looking for that book, because it is a, it is a hefty collection. Um, but Dr. Chip Gruen, thank you so much for joining me today. I have had an absolute blast, and I have learned so much. Thank you very much, Greg. I really appreciate the invitation. 